Hi, everybody, and welcome to Vegan Organic Network Gardener's Question Time today. I'm Ellen Mary. So I'm your host today, and we have an amazing um, group of panelists here. They have been Gardener's Question Times before this, so if you haven't been part of it before, you can uh, make comments and chat and do some follow-ups afterwards. And whilst we progress, I'm going to read out the questions that have been sent to us, and our wonderful panelists will um, answer them the best we possibly can. And um, I am vegan, I'm a gardener, I, I travel all around to talk about the well-being benefits of gardening, and um, we've got some fabulous panellists for tonight. So, kicking that off, our first panellist is Piers Warren, and Piers is a conservationist, he's an author and keen grower of organic fruit and vegetables. He is the founder of Wild Eye, the International School of Wildlife Filmmaking. He's the writer of several books and co-author of The Vegan Cook and Gardener. So welcome, Piers, to the panel. He's been um, on the panel before and always has some fantastic answers to help you out. Uh, hi, Piers. And there he hi. <laughs> How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for the for the lovely intro. I'm I'm actually speaking to you from Norfolk, where I've just moved from Wales, where I grew some of the biggest onions of my life. <laughs> and uh, I think the removal guys were quite surprised because, as well as the furniture and stuff, they were also having to load crates of onions and pumpkins and <laughs> garlic and other stuff that I'd grown. I, of course, I had to bring it with me. I couldn't leave it, having spent um this season growing it all so uh yeah lovely to be on the panel again awesome thank you so much Piers that is the sign of a true gardener moving all of the pumpkins that you've grown <laughs> as well <laughs> and welcome to Norfolk I'm a Norfolk person as well so thank you. Thank you. there we go um okay so our next panelist is Steph Hafferty and Steph is a leading authority on no dig gardening a garden and food writer edible garden consultant. She's worked as a no-dig guard, kitchen gardener for 11 years and grown on allotments for over 30 years. Stephanie writes a blog for various publications, including a regular feature for Growing Green International, and has written a number of books, including The Creative Kitchen and No-Dig Year-Round Harvests. Welcome, Steph, to the panel. Hi Hello. there. Hi. How are you doing? I'm all right. I've just been driving and there was traffic. So I'm, if you see me drinking a lot, it's because I'm trying to rehydrate myself. It is water. <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of got back in a bit of a flat. It's not vegan wine then. We believe. It's not yet. No, after this it will be. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm moving, hence everything behind me looking the way it does. So we have two panellists mid-move today. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Vegan Organic Network's Gardener's Question Time. Steph, can't wait to Thank chat you. with you and run through the questions in a moment. So introducing our third panellist, it's Aranya. And Aranya is a permaculture teacher and author of Permaculture Design, a step-by-step -step guide. He launched an online course this summer based on the design process described in the book. Currently, he's finishing a second book about the application of systems thinking and patterns in permaculture design due to be published in 2021. He's been gardening for 35 years and is especially interested in low input systems like forest gardening and no dig. So hi, Aranya. Welcome to the panel. Hi there. Good evening. How are you doing? I, I feel worse now that I've been gardening for 35 years. That makes me really old, doesn't it? I didn't write that. <laughs> Maybe, I don't think I did. But anyway, yeah. It makes you full of knowledge that all of everyone who's joined in today yeah. would like to glean off you. <laughs> Lots of mistakes, which of course is the you know key learning as well. Yeah, exactly. That's how we learn. Absolutely. Okay, well, it's super nice to meet you. That's our panelists for today. That's three, and I'll chip in if and when needed. But I'll read out the questions, and then um, we'll see how we go. For anyone who's watching, um, please pop comments in the box if you've got anything that you want to ask or join in with as we go along as well. So let's get started, shall we? Our first question is about wood ashes, and it's from Tracy. 
And the question is, we use waste wood from tree surgery in our wood burning stove and generate a significant amount of clean wood ash, which I understand to be a good source of potassium. I've been adding some to my compost bins and also sprinkling it thinly directly onto soil to let rain gradually wash it in. However, I was told that this was risky because of caustic salts damaging plant roots. Have you experienced any problems directly attributable to wood ashes and what's the best way to utilise them? And that's from Tracy. So, um, Aranya, would you be able to take that question first? I could start, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been doing that for quite some time. We've had a wood burner for many years. And so one of our things is collecting it through the winter um, into bags and then putting it down in the spring when the weather is a bit warmer. But just, I mean, for us, it's just not over applying. It's very good around fruit bushes and fruit trees. And I suppose if you have a tiny garden and you're burning lots of wood, big house, small garden, you might end up over applying it. But I think for us, certainly, we've never noticed any problems with that in terms of, you know, plants, the plants seem to like it. So that's all I can contribute really on that one. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else on the panel who would like to add anything to that? I would say look at your plants, because if they're looking fine, then they're fine, basically. <laughs> so if they're, if you're putting so much on that they're looking really poorly, then you've got a problem. But if you're just applying a small amount and it's looking fine, then it's going to be fine. As Arania said, it depends on the quantity to the garden ratio, which we don't know. But I put all the uh, wood ash from my wood burner into my compost heap or on my fruit bushes and it's not a significant amount and it it benefits the soil so it's basically the plants they will let you know if that, yeah it's okay I think, yeah. yeah pierce yeah. did you have did you want to add to that well really just to, to agree with what's been said already i've used ash in in both ways that tracy mentions both mixing it in with the compost and actually sprinkle it around the beds and um I've, I've never had a problem with it, so I think it's it's perfectly fine. Great. Aranya? It may be that if you've got plants that particularly like acid conditions, like blueberries, they might be less keen because it's quite alkaline. Um, but, you know, we put them around black, black currants, those kind of things, and they're, you know, they do prefer a little bit of acid and they don't seem bothered, so. Good. That's excellent. Thanks so much. First question tick. <laughs> I hope that's helped you, Tracy. So our next question, question number two, is um, from Tony Goodchild. And Tony says, Regener regenerative farmers say they use grazing livestock to recycle nutrients as manure and improve the soil. Isn't vegan organic farming more effective in improving the soil, for example, by using compost and green manure? Um, so thanks for that question, Tony. Uh, Steph, would you like to start answering that question, please? Okay. Um, I mean, the first thing is regenerative agriculture done properly and using animals, it is going to benefit the soil. That is an absolute fact. Uh, it's not a vegan way of doing it, but it can create amazing soil conditions if it's done properly with animals moving across and the rest of the biodiversity. I think one of the criticisms about veganic gardening is that they cannot replicate that, that it can't be as good. And I would disagree with that because veganic growing done properly, as you say, with the right composts, with green manures, whatever is appropriate for the situation, composted wood chips, those kinds of things. Um, you are creating a biodiversity which is including a huge amount of wildlife as well, which creates excellent soil conditions. It's not a putting the green manures and that's just happening on its own. And um, it's interacting with other wildlife. It's interacting particularly with the soil life. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's better than in a natural habitat because obviously roaming animals in a natural habitat does create good soil, but it is certainly as good as. I don't think there's actually been detailed comparative studies. I've not come across any. I've heard um, lectures by growers doing both kinds of regenerative agriculture. Um, the big issue, obviously, with organic growing is 
that if you're using livestock, then it is with an environment that is not good for the animals. So you're looking for other ways of doing it, but it is not animal exclusive. They're just choosing to be there, which is a different thing. Okay, thanks, Steph. Um, Aranya, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think Steph was sort of already alluded to the fact that regenerative agriculture can include veganic farming. <laughs> <laughs> as well it doesn't have to be just about animals it's about agriculture that's regenerating the landscape and of course permaculture approaches no dig approaches are doing that um, one of the things that animals do in the natural environment which we don't really see very much of these days because we got to a point where we decided we're not moving anymore and we're not letting the animals move either they're all going to stay in fenced fields is that in those kind of situations you get a build up of parasites and worming uh, worm burdens and so on so then people usually use some kind of vermifuge, some nasty chemical wormers, and that gets in the soil and, and antibiotics and all kinds of hideous things. So the moving the animals around kind of addresses that. One of the other things that um, regenerative uh, farming from that perspective, mob grazing, plant, holistic plant grazing does is all, no, not so much because what wild animals do is they move nutrients around and they move seeds around and they move water around from watering holes to dry lands and so on which of course most animals even in these kind of mob grazing systems don't really do because they're too, still too constrained but the risk i suppose that veganic if you're only going to eat from your land if you're growing purely for yourself you're only eating off your land there is a risk of if there are mineral deficiencies in the land that is essentially it's not in the geology then you're at risk potentially of getting those deficiencies whereas animals bring those nutrients by eating plants from other places and pooing them but wild animals do that too to some degree birds and rabbits or whatever so i think it's very unlikely in the world we live in that we're going to suffer from that but that's what animals do and that's one thing that we just need to just be aware of but i think if you're buying a bit of food from your local um veganic veg box scheme from over there and you're growing food for yourself and you're eating from different soils then that's not going to be a problem so for me veganic it doesn't really have that issue it's just a different way of doing things yeah thank you that's uh, really good um answers Piers, do you have anything you'd like to add or have we covered that question yeah well just that uh, this year um was a really interesting experiment in that I had an allotment plot and I think I was the only veganic grower on the plot. Um, the site itself had um, huge amounts of animal manure delivered in a massive pile which any of the growers could could help themselves to and most of them did and of course I didn't. So it was interesting to see that that with my veganic principles and despite not using any animal manure, I still managed to grow some um, impressive crops in terms of, you know, the size of my onions, which I've mentioned already, but also lots of uh, very good sized pumpkins, enormous carrots, and um, certainly some of the other plot holders there were interested in what techniques I use to, to grow such big crops. So it was a good opportunity to point out that animal manure isn't essential. You know, you can do it with um, plant-based techniques. So that, that was really interesting this year. That's great. I've got a, a no-dig veganic allotment as well. And I had the most ginormous cabbages this year and i wasn't even there for spring so everything was really late on my plot get you know sowing and planting these cabbages were so enormous that the guys around me were all questioning me like hi hey, what have you done what have you put on it what have you put in the soil i'm like <laughs> not what you have in yours <laughs> and it's a really great way to be able to converse with people isn't it and just show them that there are, is another way to gardening too so okay that's great thank you so much everyone so our next question then is from Alice and Alice says early this year I took over a very overgrown neglected allotment I've built raised beds and I'm gradually but successfully ridding the site of weeds using polythene and patience. 
Next spring, I'll be ready to fill eight new raised beds. Neighbouring allotmenteers say that one end of the site gets pretty wet over winter. Uh, I would like advice on what to fill the beds with. It needs to be peat-free, affordable, vegan, organic, and I will be using no big approach to fruit, veg, and flower growing. That sounds like my spot <coughs> there, definitely, um, Alice. <laughs> so thanks for that question. I think this is this question comes up quite a lot on Gardener's Question Times and in general out there in the ether. And um, Steph, would you like to answer that one first? Okay. Um, yeah, my first question would be, do you actually need the wooden sided raised beds? Um, sometimes people do, um, but one of the problems with wooden sided raised beds, it takes more compost to fill them. And also you're creating a habitat for slugs, snails and wood lice to live in. And burrowing creatures are more likely to think this is a good place to live. Often there's a bit of a myth about winter dampness being bad for the soil and growing. I mean, I grow here in Somerset, it rains a lot and it's heavy clay and I don't use any wooden sides except on an area where it's rubble. However, some people choose to and that's great. And the thing to fill them with really is compost, the best compost you can get. Um, I wouldn't put anything woody at the bottom that can create an anaerobic layer which attracts slugs and it also can create a habitat for the pests I've already described. Um, so sourcing that amount of veganic compost, actually any compost, it can be quite tricky. So my first thing would be to really question, do you need wooden sides? If you don't, and it's clear of weeds as you've been describing. Don't worry about the mare's tail for a minute because that's a long-term project. Um, you just need two or three centimetres of compost on the surface and off you go. Um, with the um, horse tail, mare's tail, that has tap roots going down about 15 feet into the ground. It takes ages to get rid of it, usually at least a decade. And all you need to do is just keep pulling it out when it pops up. It's great for the soil, it's full of minerals. And the one good thing about it is it doesn't compete with other plants, unlike something like bindweed, which is gonna grow up and strangle. It will just grow. I once had to manage a polytunnel that had it all popping up and I still grow absolutely everything. So um, actually sourcing a lot of compost um, will be will be very dependent on your area. You can get green waste compost from councils, but that would not be nutrient rich enough to use on its own um, and make compost heaps, obviously. But I'm not quite sure where you'd get it from without knowing more about where you are. Yeah, thank you, Steph. So actually, one of the things that Alice said was that the reason for a raised beds rather than going straight into the ground is because their fellow allotment tiers had said that's the best way to counter the wetness over winter. Yeah, but I hear that about my plot. Mm. That's why I think there's so much advice that's put out and quite often it's given to women on allotments as well, if we're honest. I mean, I've had people telling me how to grow bas brassicas while they're standing next to my brassicas. And I'm going, it's my job actually. And they're still telling me. So there can be that dynamic that's going on. So I would really look at the conditions. If the very bottom of the plot is waterlogged, then you just don't grow anything there in the winter. And maybe one of the first things, even with no dig, would be if it is very waterlogged, is to dig a drain. Because that will be a long-term solution to a drainage problem. But I would certainly challenge that advice on you have to, because an awful lot of you have tos, like you have to use animal manure, simply aren't the case. Yeah, that, that's absolutely, yeah, that's completely right. Like a lot of, we were actually saying before we came live that there's a lot of trial and error, you know, yeah. and you give it a go one year, if it doesn't work, try something different the next year until you get what suits you, your way of growing, your plot, every site is different, you know, and, and that's the best way to really kind of learn how how your soil is or your gut in your garden or on your allotment um, advice is great but you always listen to advice but take the bits from it that you want to implement and um, would anyone else like to add anything to that question nope we're good okay 
Great. I could. I was just waiting to see if Piers wanted to say something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, Alice doesn't say what a soil is. Um, I mean, just yes, coming back to the equisetum, the horsetail is yes, it roots very long way down. It's very good at accumulating several things, as Steph said, including silica. And very often these plants grow in places which are that don't have much of that. So things find it difficult to other plants find it difficult to compete because those plants like equisetum have deep tap roots or deep root systems, not tap roots, deep root systems that can go down and find what they need, whereas the other plants don't. So um, I find generally if you've got plants that are growing well that you don't particularly want to eat directly, use directly, what we might call weeds, is I just use them to make fertilizer. Obviously don't put seeds into your <laughs> system, but you know, cut them when they're not seeding. Don't put bits of root in um, because obviously that can propagate root, um, things as well. You know, uh, but essentially to, because those plants are accumulating what they need and they're doing well, they can make good fertilizer um, for what you want to grow. So, and yeah, as Steph said, don't try and dig it out because yeah, no, you, you'd need explosives. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be doing it for yeah. years and years and years. And, and actually having like weeds on the allotment is a good sign of what kind of soil you've got. You know, I know yeah. people down my plot who are like, ah, I've got so many nettles. And I'm like, well, you've got amazing, you've got nutrient rich soil. You've got a lovely cup of tea and you've got plant food, you know, so don't discount it all the time. Like that's a good way of knowing what soil that you're actually working with. Um, okay, that's great. I hope that has helped you, Alice. Uh, on to our next question, which is from Liz. Liz says, is seaweed a good substitute for well-rotted manure? Um, Piers, would you like to start that one, please? Sure. Well, uh, seaweed has been used for centuries as a, as a soil improver. It's rich in potassium, which is one of the essential nutrients that, that plants need. Um, it's not so high in the others, such as, such as um, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon. So... Um, think of it in terms of a green when, when you're making your compost. You know how we, we talk about adding greens and browns together. So the greens being, as you might think, all the, the, the green leaves and the uh, prunings and the fresh prunings, things like that. The browns being cardboard, paper, um, dead leaves and dry brown material, that sort of thing. So mixing the two together. So when you add your compost, think of it in terms of being a green, although it's often brown in colour. Um, when, you, when you've collected it, uh, you may find some of it is in really long strands. So it's, it is a good idea to chop it up to some extent uh, before you add it to the heap. And um, really, there's three ways of using it. You can, you can add it to your compost heap, as already discussed. You can make a... Uh, your own seaweed liquid feed simply by adding a big handful of seaweed to a bucket of water and leave it anything from a month to quite a few months um, and uh, then use that as a liquid feed direct onto your, your plants. And the other way is to use it as a mulch, spreading it on the surface. And again, it's probably an idea to cut up certainly some of the bigger pieces before you spread it around and like most mulches you can you can do it up to six inches thick if you want one thing i found using it using it on the, the on the surface of the beds was that some of the seaweeds like like bladder rack for example when it's really dried out in the sun it can form these very hard brittle mats on the surface which can then make it very difficult to do anything to the soil like hoeing for example that's another reason for cutting up cutting it up beforehand um a final thing to say is that the, there's a lot of discussion about whether there's too much salt um in in the seaweed so some people do rinse it down beforehand by spraying it with a hose or dunking it in a bucket of water um but looking at what other people say about it the consensus of opinion is that really people haven't found um, uh, too much of a salt problem. 
of course when you're putting a mulch around plants you don't want to pile it up against the stems of the plant anyway that's the same with, with most mulches so that's just uh, something to bear in mind great thank you Piers. that's really helpful um anyone would like to add to that we live near the sea so we use a lot of seaweed um primarily as a mulch so around fruit trees uh, we put a lot of we inherited we moved 15 months ago so we're not in the middle of move but we've not been here long and uh, one of the beds we inherited we planted up onions and we just put seaweed around um, just to get it going because it had a lot of clay this bed and the onions were amazing so we you know and it's interesting as well as Piers is saying when seaweed dries out it shrivels up a lot and it becomes very hard and then it rains again and it goes back to being soft and um so yeah it's good stuff i would not pick it up from the top of the tide line on the beach though because that tends to have been out in the open for a bit longer and you'll find a lot of sand flies and things hopping around so we brought some back in a bag at one point and we emptied the bag out and there are all these sand hoppers <laughs> jumping everywhere and i just felt bad that i'd taken them from their natural environment and dumped them sort of 100 meters up a hill so uh, just look out for that as well <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was given some because I don't live near the sea at the moment and I put it on my asparagus bed because I met someone a few years ago who had the best asparagus ever and that was what he put on every year and that year I grew the best asparagus I'd ever had. It was they were like triffids. It was amazing. They just kept coming. So and but the one thing I would check is your local bylaws because apparently it does differ where you're able to take it from. And there's certainly rules against turning up with a trailer and loading it all up. So it's worth checking. If you're just taking a bucket, that's one thing. But I think um, from what I've heard from people who use it every single year, that you do need to check this. Great. That's great. Thank you. So I think we can yeah. definitely say that seaweed is a great substitute for well water. Yeah. <laughs> definitely okay thank you, Sam. <laughs> thank you so much so uh okay so on to our next question which is from joyce peterson i live in chile on a small organic holding my question is can you add sourdough starter and other scobies from kombucha and apple cider vinegar to compost so um yeah pierce would you be able to pick that one up please Sure, yes. Well, uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. You can add them to your compost. They're adding nutrients, bacteria, yeasts. It's all good stuff uh, to mix in with the compost heap. If you're a commercial baker, you will be adding relatively small amounts of your, of your starter um, to the compost. Um, before I talk more about scovies, it's just worth saying that... Um, Yes, also when I've been making sourdough bread, I um, initially uh, felt a bit bad about throwing away half the starter every day because, you know, you're buying this expensive organic flour to make it. And uh, so I, I did research on what you can do with your, your starter and as well as putting it in the compost, there are lots of other ways that you can use it in cooking. So you can add it to uh, non sourdough breads you can add it to cake mixtures or you can make specific things with it like sourdough crackers sourdough pancakes etc um, so there are lots of other ways not to waste your um, your sourdough starter um, as for um, others that um, so for example from making kombucha the um, fermented beverage um, so the, 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 the starter, if you like, that they use is often referred to as a SCOBY. And, and that actually stands for a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, S-C-O-B-Y. That's, that's where the word SCOBY comes from. And really a sourdough starter is a type of SCOBY as well. But SCOBY is more normally spoken about when referred to things like kombucha. It has a different consistency than a sourdough starter, which tends to be quite liquid. Um, the kombucha scoby tends to be a bit more solid, more like rubbery. And if you have it in a jar, it, it ends up being like a rubbery disc. So again, perfectly good to add to uh, composts, um, but because it has this 
um, solidity to it, it is a good idea to cut it up into small pieces before adding it to um, the compost. You can also use it as a soil improver for um, plants that prefer things a bit more, more acid. So if you have a plant that prefers an ericaceous compost, you can um, chop up your scoby and mix it in with uh, just some regular compost and that will do those plants good. Um, so it does have this slight acidity to it, but it, it's, it's not enough to worry about it causing a problem. So for example, um, I know that um, the sort of worms you get in compost heaps, the, the brandling worms, that sort of thing, they, actually, they absolutely love scobies and they they will go to it and specifically eat uh, scoby residue so that the acidity of that certainly isn't doing it any harm i i wouldn't add uh, a lot of very acidic stuff like i you know if i've used a lot of lemons i wouldn't necessarily put all the lemon peel and stuff into the composting because you can you can whack up the acidity that way but it seems to be not a problem at all with scobies or starters so absolutely go for it Thank you so much, Pierce. That's, that's a brilliant answer. And actually, you can put scobies on your blueberries, but not wood ashes, as we said, uh, as as we were chatting about before. So you have an answer for blueberries from two questions there. <laughs> if you're growing anything that needs a little bit of acid. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add to that question at all? Except I do put all my citrus peel in my compost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> yes i have uh, i've had kombucha before but um i did read also that you can put your extra scoby into smoothies and consume it so it never got as far as the compost tea <laughs> is it nice yeah, it's yeah it's a little bit acidic but it's fine yeah it seemed all right it just i put other things in and don't really notice the taste of <laughs> Get all well, I, I managed to kill it some years ago, so I haven't done it for a while. So. Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope that's helped, um, Joyce. That was a really good answer there. Um, okay, so on to the next question. Um, I have an unlimited supply of chipped branch wood. What is the most effective way of using it to improve the fertility of my no-dig soil? while also helping turn my garden into a carbon sink. And that's from John Walker. And um, perhaps, Steph, you could start off with answering this one, please. Uh, yeah, you're very lucky. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> Certainly, put it in a nice big pile and let it break down. That's the best thing for annual veg, no dig beds. If you've got fruit bushes, anything like that, then you can put it on top and let it break down in situ. You don't really want it on annual veg beds. Um, it can create too much of a habitat on a domestic scale for things like wood lice, which will come along and eat your plants and other pests. And it's really much better used composted there. Um, a sprinkling is really good on paths as well. It, the way it reacts with the soil is it really helps to feed all the soil fungi. So you're helping create um, a really fantastic environment. And with the idea of the compost sink, no dig gardening helps keep, uh, not compost, sorry, carbon, no dig gardening by the nature of the fact that you're not digging locks carbon into the soil it doesn't release it into the atmosphere so just doing no dig whether you're using composted wood chips or your own garden compost made from something else does act as a carbon sink <laughs> i keep thinking of like a black hole sinking down i don't know why <laughs> but send it to me i want it no dig the way to go does it's anyone else have anything to add to that I could. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, we use it around perennials because uh, and not to you know, never put it into the soil, just put it on the surface so it can be gradually consumed by uh, bugs and so on. But my favorite situation is where you have a big pile of wood chip and the fungus is in there and it just basically eats it up over time. And you just see this fantastic compost gradually emerge from these wood chips. Uh, and then that's then that's ready to go on the garden. 
as uh, Steph would attest, I'm sure, that you don't want to be putting things into the soil that aren't fully decomposed because that attracts all of those bugs. Um, you want to wait for it to be fully composted. So, and, and yeah, wood chips make amazing compost. So. I just love the smell of wood chips. Mm. Oh, it's just, you know, that lovely woody earthy smells amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope that has helped you, John. Um, okay, so we are kind of moving swiftly towards the 45 minutes. So I'll move on with the next question. Um, and how do you secure sufficient nutrient input in a vegan organic food production system based on a mix of annuals and perennials? So far, I found it difficult to see how I can add enough nutrients to the cycle of annuals without overworking myself and without the use of animal manure. My compost, toilet and food is just not sufficient and that's from Thor. Um, perhaps, Seth, can you just um, pick that one up first, please? Okay, um, I've heard this a lot of times before. Um, it's usually used by people who very much believe that you have to have animal manures in your garden. Um, my usual reply is most domestic gardeners with their own domestic compost heaps are by their very nature not using um, any animal products because one would generally not compost, if, you know, in an omnivorous household, you wouldn't compost your bones and eggs and bits of cheese and whatever in the garden because you'd attract rats unless you've got specific hot bin style compost heaps and yet nobody questions the fact that you can grow great veg from your own homemade compost um, so I think there's a bit of a myth going out there that you have to have animal manures and also when you're making a plant-based compost as I said earlier it is part of a whole process that is involving insects and other creatures. So you have got the whole cycle of living and dying. You've got decaying animal matter that's naturally occurring in the compost, as well as pooing and all their other secretions, like lovely thought for this time of the <laughs> evening. So it is rich in all the fungus. It's rich in decaying insect matter, any visiting mice having a nice poo or whatever and um, as well as all the plant matter it isn't an exclusive it's not like just getting a lettuce leaf and putting it on the soil and going well that's it so I think there is a lot of mythology around it and absolutely for sure you can grow really good vegetables and fruit and herbs and everything else using entirely veganic i.e you haven't added horse manure or whatever, composts. Um, it is, it's just another myth, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure others have got something to say about that as well, but I'd just love to say that whilst I'm not gardening on a massive scale, I have an allotment plot and a garden, and it's completely veganic, it's completely no dig. Um, there's obviously no animal product use whatsoever. Um, I am very productive, um, I feed us all, I have amazing success with annuals and perennials and my fruit is uh, um, absolutely wonderful i've had some of the most gigantic vegetables i've ever grown um since i've been gardening veganic so i could just completely that whole myth of having to use animal manure needs to be completely quashed because it's just simply not true <laughs> um, would Anya, uh, Aranya or Pierce like to add to that at all? I no. can if Pierce not going to say Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I think the no dig thing is critical as well. It makes a huge difference because what the way that plants feed is not by just taking things directly from the soil. They rely on the life in the soil to basically do the, the work. Plants are feeding sugars to the life in the soil, which is eating things eating each other and then that's being reabsorbed by the plant so if you if you're disturbing that all the time by digging so you could have vegan organic which is doing a lot of digging and disturbing that if that infrastructure that's being made by the life in the soil then that's that's not as good for me in my experience as perennial systems or no dig which is deliberately trying to allow the soil to retain its structure um, and yeah I mean it's, for me, my no dig 
gardening, which I've only been doing for a short while, a few years compared to the rest of my gardening. <laughs> but, you know, when, when you can grow yakons that look like that, for me, that just says it's working. So, yeah, the, the proof is in the plants. It's like what Steph yeah. said earlier on, really, isn't it? The plants will tell you if they're happy. You, yeah. your, you know, your harvest will, will just show that. And I haven't met anyone yet who gardens organically or and no dig who hasn't said that the success has been fantastic. So if you look at sorry. Yeah, I yeah. waved or something but if you look on a farm scale at what Tolly's doing which isn't no dick but it is entirely veganic and he's producing a huge amount of food farm scale with no animal input so it also does I mean I'm I've run market gardens I've never done like farm scale but it does you know it is it possible to do it on a much larger scale and still have superb vegetables and things yeah, but certainly not digging is the key to most things. Yeah, we um, we do actually have um, panellists on the Vegan Organic Network, Gardeners Question Time, who do uh, garden veganically on a larger scale. So if you're listening to this at home, and um, make sure you check out um, coming up Gardeners Question Times and because you will find other panellists who are, who are gardening on that kind of scale as well. And you can submit questions and ask those as well. So we've got three minutes left. So I'm going to just, I'm, there's, there's one more question I'd just love to get answered and I'm going to um, literally get to the point of the question rather than reading the whole thing out. Um, we have someone living here in South Florida in the USA growing herbs and, and vegetables and, and fruit, compost food scraps, but wondering if you could suggest an all-purpose compost tea fertilizer to brew. Um, and I've read about combinations of molluscs with fully composted matter and rainwater to brew for about two days or until it frosts. Do you have any go-to prescription for potted plants? Who would like to take that very last question and be really quick? <laughs> Does Piers want to have a go at that? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying that I, um, I often grow two different compost, uh, make two different compost teas during the year, a stinging nettle one and a comfrey one. And um, the stinging nettle one is uh, really good for um, adding nitrogen and getting your plants going when they're at the early stages and growing. And then the comfrey tea is, is better for later in the year when potash is needed um, for uh, plants that are fruiting and cropping. Um, and a general purpose one, of course, you can, you can mix together and, and use it that way. You just have to basically get over the smell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I wonder if what they're referring to molasses, which sounds like the kind of I, I would call what Piers is doing a liquid feed to avoid that confusion with compost tea, which seems to be about brewing microbes by feeding them, giving them lots of air, lots of water, propagating microbes, which, as my understanding, is about rejuvenating degraded soils that have no life in them and not something you would do on a regular basis, whereas what Piers is doing is making a liquid feed to feed the plants, which is a, is a regular thing. So I, I'm not sure, I would say what they need is probably the liquid feed rather than the microbes, unless of course they've got particularly bad soil at the moment, so. Yeah, because I think we're looking at specifically potted plants in that question anyway. So yeah, I think like the, li the liquid feed is- Oh, right, yeah. It probably right for that particular one. I use comfrey and nettle um, feed for potted plants and where it's needed on the plot. And as long as you can just put a peg on your nose, it's all mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> so our 45 minutes are up. So thank you so much to everyone who's uh, joined the questioners, Gardener's Question Time today. And thank you everyone also who's been chatting away in the comments. It's really lovely just to see such a good community helping each other out with their gardening questions. Thank you so much to our panelists today as well for spending time being here and talking veganic gardening and um, also there are more gardeners question times that will come up um, next year so i hope you all have a lovely festive month and uh, get outside even though it might be cold it's still super good for you there's always something to do and keep your eye on veganic organic network socials online and on the website for more to come so thank you everyone thanks for joining in and happy gardening everybody bye bye, bye, -bye. thank you
Many thanks to our wonderful panel and thanks to you for watching. Please go to our website to subscribe to our free newsletter and to support us by becoming a member or by making a donation. We're back in 2021. Keep the questions coming in.